nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Howdy, folks. Um, so I'm, my name is Mike Ruppert. Um, I'm a professor here at Purdue. Um, and uh, I'll just talk a little bit about um, what we've been using NanoHub for in my group, um, both in research and in um, and more recently in, in education outreach um, type applications. So I'll actually start with the education stuff and, and, and go through a couple of applications where we found it really useful. Um, so I wanted to start, um, in case there are folks here who are not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, um, just fine if you're not. Um, it, uh, this is the so some of the apps I think that George showed were mostly written with this the, the Rapture interface I believe, um, and I think that's mostly being I think most most NanoHub infrastructure is transition transition to the Jupyter Notebook interface. Is that correct me if I'm wrong? Yeah. So um, so so most new tools use this Jupyter Notebook interface. Um, so I wanted to start just a little bit talking about what a Jupyter Notebook is in general. How many people here have used a Jupyter Notebook before? Yeah, so most of us, but not everybody. Okay, yeah. So, um, so, so Jupyter stands for Julia, Python, and R, I believe. Um, so it's it's a a Jupyter. So Jupyter is a software package um, that essentially lets you run Python code in your web browser. Um, it's a little bit more than that, but it's uh, if you download the Anaconda package for Python programming, um, uh, uh, there will be a Jupyter module included. So it, it's essentially a, a software package that lets you run. Um, uh, Python code as well as R and Julia, um, and, and the notebook is just the file format that where, where you store everything. So when you, um, if you if you're programming the, in Python at the command line, you sort of write a, a text file and then you compile and execute that code. Um, a a Jupyter notebook does that whole thing, but in kind of a, a GUI window, right? So you, you hit sort of Control Enter and it executes the code, and um, your, your variables stay current, so you can sort of run the code and then check, oh, what was that one variable? You can go down to the bottom. It's, it's, it's more interactive than, than a static um, Python script. So that's the basic idea of what, what Jupyter Notebooks are. Um, and um, so I wanted to then say a little bit about what's unique about using Jupyter Notebooks on NanoHub. Um, and, and one of the cool things about them is that about the NanoHub interfaces, you notice I just clicked this app mode button at the top. And what that does is it hides all of the code. All of the code disappears. Um, and what's left behind is just the output from the code. In this case, it's a GUI for students to run simulations of a, a lattice protein, um, looking at a lattice, the different conformations of a lattice protein. Um, and so this is a, an interface where the students don't have to look at all of this code um, if you don't want them to, <laughs> or your, your end user doesn't have to if they don't want to. And we do, I should say, for, for education and outreach purposes, we do both. Right? So we have, we have some codes where the students are supposed to look at the code, and then other applications where you know, we just want a middle schooler to point and click and run something, rather than um, rather than actually programming something themselves. Um, so so it's 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 useful for both, and you can toggle in and out. You don't have to. You're not stuck with one or the other. Any anytime you're in the app, you can, um, unless you have it, unless you have restrictions set up so that they can so that the user can't, you can always toggle back and see what the code actually looks like that's that's producing the output. So it's a nice interface for um, uh, for that reason, just for sort of cleanliness. You don't have uh, or visual cleanliness. You can hide all of the stuff that's kind of behind the scenes. Um, the other, the, the big advantage um, is there's no software installation. So we've, we've used a lot of, we've transitioned many of our undergrad PCAM labs here to use Jupyter Notebooks. Um, initially, we were doing that with getting everybody to install Anaconda on their home computer or use a library computer that had it installed. That was a huge headache <laughs> because there's always somebody, um, Safa, are you here? There's always, there's always somebody whose computer won't install Anaconda properly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and it's not their fault, but their computer won't do it. Um, and, then, uh, and then it's really hard to get everybody on the same page. So it's, it's a great thing to have a website where everybody can go and log in, and then they all have the same installation of everything, uh, of all packages you're using, right? So there's no, you don't have to worry about who's got which version of what. Um, uh, file sharing is easy, so we have it set up, you can set up a web page where students can download um, uh, source code, that kind of thing. Um, I should say this is useful for sharing students, from, sharing files from teacher to students. There isn't a mechanism, as, as far as I know now, for students to send files back to the teacher via NanoHub. So keep that in mind. Um, but then, uh, yeah, code can be hidden. Um, and then compute power. So, so this is uh, through NanoHub. I'll, I'll give some examples later. But you can actually then submit jobs to a, a compute cluster here at Purdue. Um, where you can actually run, I, I think, the, at the moment, you can do something like four hours on a 20 CPU node. Um, so you can get up to something like 80 CPU hours um, for, for a single job, which is not bad. You can run a fairly decent MD simulation with 80 CPU hours. OK, so that's kind of a basic idea. And then I'm just going to give a few, a few examples of applications that we've, we've put together. 
Um, so this is, a, oh, this is the, the app that we showed earlier. Um, this is something we use for my Chem 372 class. It's a biophysics or, or physical chemistry for biology majors, um, pharmaceutical science majors. And we use this to introduce concepts in statistical mechanics and protein folding. Right? So um, we, we put together a very simple um, lattice protein model. There's four amino acids. Sorry, only four. <laughs> um, and they have very simple properties, right? So proline likes to form kinks. Lysine is positively charged. Um, uh, glutamate is negatively charged. Alanine is hydrophobic. Um, and we put in a little potential energy function that we talk about with the students in the class. And then they can go through and actually run little simulations. We can give them puzzles where, you know, find a protein that folds into this, find a sequence that'll fold into this conformation, right? Or find what's the missing amino acid to make this protein fold with 99% accuracy. Um, so it, it's a really nice interface for students to get in and just kind of play around. Um, and this is, you know, it, it looks sort of simple, but even with a nine residue peptide, there's a lot of confirmations actually that you have to search through. So it's, it's nice to have a sort of centralized resource where you can um, do that crunching, the number crunching on, on the web. You don't have to have students try to, you know, draw things out by hand or install code on their computers to do it. Um, and they can just uh, get some qualitative inference about um, uh, things like, um, uh, how much, how precisely a protein folds, what's the length of the protein as a function of temperature, um, the partition function as a function of temperature. So these, these are the sort of applications we use um, for 372. So this is, this is a standalone app that we use once in the course. So similar to what George was mentioning, um, this is not something they use all the time, but there's, there's one module in the course where we talk about protein folding where a bunch of people log in and, and use this. So we also have spikes once a year in our, uh, in our <laughs> user base. Um, we did something a little bit more extensive with NanoHub for, for the 37, this is, uh, 3730, I think it's 37301 actually. Yeah, 37301 is the correct, the correct course number. Um, uh, this is the, our, our first semester undergraduate PCHEM lab. Um, and, and for that, we were interested in having a, um, a sort of a unified lab manual where students could both read their assignments and then go in and actually enter data and process data in Python um, without having to sort of have multiple places where, where data is stored um, and pull from place to place. So, um, so we actually set up a web page where um, students can come in and actually um, uh, click on these various links. This is all within a Jupyter Notebook interface still. You click on the link and it goes to the sort of the, the lab manual page. You can have plugins with um, molecular graphics viewers so you can see the molecules you're working on. Um, if you click on these little go buttons, it'll take you different parts of the lab. So this is actually the, the, the manual or the the protocol for what they're actually going to do experimentally. Um, this is a UV-Vis experiment where they're looking at absorption spectra of various molecules and then trying to correlate that with, um, with the length of the molecule. There's another plug-in here where they go and run a simulation, doing a, a sort of a particle in a box simulation to see how big should the molecule be or how, how, how should the absorption frequency shift as you change the length of the molecule. And then at the end, they go in here to, so they've copied this now to a local directory. They'll go in and, and here's a place where they actually use the code. They go in and type their data in or load the data via a text file. Um, and then they'll do things like plot the data, do a curve fit analysis, um, um, uh, uh, analyze, visualize, et cetera. Um, and then they can fill out their, their answers to the questions. And then they actually just submit, they download this as a PDF at the end and submit the PDF output from the Jupyter Notebook. So it's kind of a one-stop shop for um, hosting the material, students accessing the material, analyzing their data, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we've had, we've had nice success with that so far. Um, We've done something similarly with um, Chem 676. This is a, a graduate course in molecular spectroscopy um, uh, where students are um, running simple MD simulations. So these, these are just two-dimensional MD simulations. The students actually go through and um, program uh, at least parts of, um, the, some, some of you have taken this course, so program at least parts of the MD simulation themselves. So they you know, look at, okay, what happens when I have charged particles interacting with each other, um, either single atoms or, or diatomic molecules interacting with each other, and I come in and do something like hit it with a laser pulse. Um, it's, uh, it's coincidental that the molecules equilibrate. There's a Langevin thermostat here that, that makes it, which the students also work with, um, that, that makes them sort of thermalize into a, into a condensed blob. It's coincidence that this looks like a dog that wasn't planned. There, no animals were harmed in the making of this experiment. Um, but, uh, but they watch and see what happens, okay, when I blast my, my little crystal apart with the laser pulse and then watch it reassemble into some, some new form. Um, so we use this to, to look at things like nonlinear spectroscopy and um, uh, nonlinear response, um, just simple absorption spectra, right? So, so they'll actually run a simulation with a big box of molecules and watch, okay, what happens when the laser field comes in and starts to polarize those molecules and you can see sort of a beating pattern in the box um, and then you get a polarization trace at the end um, and you can Fourier transform that and get an absorption spectrum. Um, so it's, it's kind of a nice place. And, and, and in this context, the students 
students are actually doing the programming themselves, um, or at least part of the programming themselves, um, to learn how to, how to do things like Fourier transforming um, uh, in Python um, and how to interpret that spectroscopically. OK. Um, and then at the, at the, the, the pre-undergraduate level, this is an example of, um, this is the, the egg lab, I guess is what we call it. So this is something we put together with our, um, the, the K-12 outreach folks at Purdue here a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, experimentally, we have them come into my lab and um, we, we're, we're boiling an egg there in the, in the beaker, or part of an egg, um, dropping a little bit of raw egg white um, into the beaker. Um, and they actually go in then and take a, a f an FTIR spectrum, a for, uh, an infrared spectrum of, of the egg white, um, both before and after it's cooked. And you can see experimentally that there's this big shift to the red toward lower frequencies when you cook the egg. Um, and we know, in retrospect, that that corresponds to aggregation of the proteins, right? So the proteins are aggregating together. That's what turns the egg white. Um, and that gets reflected in the formation of a lot of beta aggregate content, which shows up spectroscopically via this, this low frequency peak. Um, and so. How does this relate to NanoHub? Well, after students do this in the lab, they'll go through and actually run a simulation. This is another app that we have called um, AmidSpec, where it, it simulates vibrational spectra of um, uh, various protein secondary structure types. You can, you can plug in and pull a structure from the protein data bank here, um, and then go through and um, simulate what would the absorption spectrum look like of various chains, either the entire structure or, or small subunits of the structure. Um, and you can actually calculate what should the infrared spectrum look like. And then what you'll see, um, and what the students see as they um, calculate the spectra um, is that the spectrum shifts to the red as you add more beta sheet content. So as you add more and more chains um, to the aggregate, you start to further and further redshift um, the absorption profile. Um, okay, so those are all sort of education slash outreach um, applications. I wanted to give a couple of examples of, of sort of, of research applications that, that we've worked on in my lab. So the, the AMID spec tool that I've shown here, these are, this is currently education grade. We're, we're working on uh, moving it up to, to research grade. Um, but the, 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 uh, before I go into details of, of what we've done here so far, I want to sort of take a side note and um, uh, just point out, at least in, from, from my perspective, what really primarily limits the adoption of scientific software packages, at least in my experience. Um, so the, the, the example here is a code that I wrote during my PhD for, for doing research grade infrared spectroscopy simulations of proteins. Um, and I discovered very quickly um, that there, were, there was one thing primarily that stopped people from using code like this. Um, in my experience, it's the, the fact that they have to use the Linux command line to install it. Right? You have to actually go and run a bash script and download the code and compile it and make sure that your libraries are all working properly. Um, and uh, as a result, at least partly of that, um, even though the code works very nicely for what it does, um, you, you see over here on the side, there's the highlighted box here says that there's two people watching this code. That's me and the other developer, right? So it's, it's been out there for 10 years, and uh, recently people have started to use it a little bit. But, um, but it's, uh, there's a big barrier to entry. Um, even if you have code that people want, um, there's a big barrier to entry to getting people to actually use it. Because um, it's hard. You have to invest a lot of time to, to do that download installation stuff. Um, so uh, the point of all that is that NanoHub makes this a whole lot easier. Um, so we've, in, in the, 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 the AMID spec app that I pointed out earlier, does a much, much cruder approximation to what uh, this, this GAMID, the, the, GitHub code, the GitHub code does. But we have about 30 times the users. Um, 30 times as many people have used that code um, uh, compared to the research grade, um, uh, you know, the, the high quality research grade one. Um, and, and that's, you know, we, we've only sort of just started to develop it. So there's a, there's a really huge, um, in terms of getting code out to people, to where people can actually use it, there's a huge benefit to, to working on something like NanoHub where you don't have to worry about the download and installation parts. All, all of the codes here are open source, by the way, so people can get access to the code and install it locally. Um, but um, not having to do that uh, makes it much easier for people to get access. OK, um, so, so the, the code where we've put sort of the most work into this is something called Pigment Hunter. Um, so, so this is a, um, a code that lets you analyze um, the optical properties of chlorophyll proteins. So this is primarily in my group. We study chlorophyll proteins. Um, we're interested in photosynthesis. Um, how do these chlorophyll molecules here embedded inside of this, um, the, so the, the, the gray wavy stuff in the background is protein environment. The, the, the bright green things here are chlorophyll molecules embedded in the protein. The, rods here, the red rods here show the, the orientation of the transition dipole moments for those chlorophylls. Um, and we're interested in, in how do the interactions between chlorophyll molecules and between the chlorophyll molecule and its environment, how do these affect the optical properties of the protein, um, where the chlorophyll will absorb light, how long the chlorophyll hangs onto that energy, how quickly it transfers it to other chlorophyll molecules, um, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, and so, so Pigment Hunter is a, 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 the user interface we've developed to, um, to get at that kind of information in a simple way. Um, and, and briefly what this does, it'll, it'll fetch chlorophyll structures from the protein data bank, um, parse through them, look for and identify um, chlorophyll molecules, related pigments, um, and then try to assign um, electronic transition properties such as, so things like the vertical transition frequency, where would, the one, where would each chlorophyll absorb light? Um, uh, at what wavelength would the chlorophyll absorb light if it didn't have any neighbors? Um, what are its interactions with its neighbors? And then how does that affect um, uh, the, the transition frequencies? Um, but a long way to do that, um, it, we also automate, uh, so there's <laughs> the, the ugly back end behind all of this um, is that most protein data bank files are s very incomplete. You're usually missing atoms of various kinds. So if you would try to run a calculation, an MD simulation on a protein directly, um, you would have major issues um, uh, because certain atoms will just be missing randomly, right? Because they weren't resolved in the crystal structure. It's not the crystallographer's fault. They're just being honest. Um, but it's nonetheless a problem um, if you want to run a molecular dynamic simulation uh, or, or do any detailed spectroscopic analysis that there are atoms missing from your structure. So the, the sort of deep, dirty back end to Pigment Hunter is, um, uh, is, is a back end that goes through and actually uses the Gromax um, open source software package for running molecular dynamic simulations. It goes in and, and sort of runs the structure through Gromax multiple times tweaking things in the structure. So if, if Gromax throws an error and says there was an atom missing in this residue, it'll try to use a mutagenesis code to fix that residue um, and then run it back through Gromax until you get a, so hopefully get a successful result where you go through something at 20 times and that's the maximum and it says, sorry, I couldn't do it. Um, so it has a, a bunch of, uh, the, the, the dirty back end is a, a bunch of code to try to fix errors um, and run things. Um, but eventually then you can actually, so through this sort of point and click interface, you can go through and actually run molecular dynamic simulations um, and then uh, load the back end of the structure viewer, do electro electrostatic calculations on that um, molecular dynamics trajectory, um, and then actually calculate things like, um, in this case, we're calculating the excitonic spectrum of the, the, the excitonic delocalization effects of those chlorophylls interacting with each other in the protein. Um, let me... Um, jump here briefly. Oh, this is so. This is a um, this is another app actually that one of my students wrote. Um, uh, Jacob, wherever you are, there he is. Um, for 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 that 372 class, so a, a different module that we've just added to the class where, where students look at um, probability calculations. Uh, you can roll dice and um, flip coins, and the students get a sense for statistics. This is that the lattice protein app, and then here's our, our, our protein data bank app. So just to show um, uh, generally how this works, let's say I'm going to put in. 3EOJ is um, Ludmilla's favorite protein, yes? Um, so this is uh, the, the Phenomatthews-Olsen uh, Phenom complex. Um, so this is, this is a bacterial chlorophyll protein. You can see a bunch of chlorophylls, uh, bacterial chlorophyll molecules bound to the center there. Um, if you want to run molecular dynamic simulations, you come down here, you can pick a force field. At the moment, you can pick any force field you want as long as it's OPLSAA. And you can pick any water molecule you want, model model you want as long as it's SPCE. Um, in the not yet released version, there are more options, but, <laughs> but for the moment, you're stuck there. Um, so uh, when you, you can write, the, uh, so if I click write inputs here, it's now, what it's now doing is processing through the file and picking out, okay, what are the various, analyzing what are the various parts of this protein. It'll put the pigments in one file, put the protein in another file, um, and then um, uh, there we have a, an interface where you'll go through step by step and it'll try to build a topology file for the protein, a topology file for the pigments, uh, and then recombine them to actually run um, the MD simulation. You can also do mutagenesis. Um, uh, demutagenesis and um, various repair processes. But um, I, I should mention here, so, so the, the, the protein viewing part of this, um, this is all based on a library called NGLView. Um, so it's, it's now available as a plugin to Jupyter. So you, you literally just say import NGLView as NGL or something like that, or NV, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then you can actually um, just build windows like this in various locations into the code. So you can put in as many windows as you want, <laughs> um, view as many proteins as you like. Um, it, it's actually pretty easy to program in um, these kinds of um, uh, viewing, uh, these kind of viewing protein viewing features. OK, we'll jump into the coding, and then uh, we should have time for more questions at the end here. OK, so, so how did you get started? If you actually want to develop something like this, it's, it's not very hard, um, but uh, some of the documentation is not real good yet. <laughs> um, so uh, there was a fair amount of trial and error in figuring out how to do these things. So let me, let me point you as quickly as I can through, through some, of these, uh, some of the steps here. So first of all, create a Nanohub account, as, as um, we heard earlier. Um, go to the Nanohub page and create an account. Um, uh, all of the apps that I've shown here were written in this Jupyter 70 tool. So nanohub.org slash tools slash Jupyter 70. You'll hit a, find a button like this, launch the tool, 
Um, and then you can just create a new Jupyter Notebook. I think, I think we even have a screenshot here. So when you launch the tool, you'll get a screen that looks something like this. This is your, your Jupyter Notebook browser. Um, initially, there won't be anything there um, uh, in your home page, but you can create folders um, through this interface, just point and click. Um, you can also, if you hit here under New, you can uh, open a terminal um, and actually put in command line, you know, make dir cd rm, et cetera. Use all of your bash terminal commands. Um, or you can work through the Jupyter Notebook interface here. OK, and then you simply create a new, mo new notebook. Again, hit New Jupyter Notebook. Um, you'll create a new notebook, and then you can actually start programming. Um, uh, all of the pretty stuff um, that's not the NGL view module comes from the IPy widgets module. So there's this, all the slide bars and the buttons and the checkboxes and the radio buttons. All of this comes through a module called IPy widgets, Interactive Python widgets. Um, and it's got um, these simple uh, declarations like this, widgets.float slider creates a slide bar um, with an output of floats. Um, and you can, you can change the bounds for that float. What, you know, what do you want to be, the, the, the lower end and the upper end? And so users can use that to just determine you know, your, your color scale or your site energy or your frequency or whatever it is you want users to be able to control. Um, they just um, uh, slide like this. And then later in the code, if you want to access the value, um, you use this. Um, um, you know, if, if, X, if, I, if I define x to be widgets.float slider, then x.value is now 7.5. And that gives me a, a, an easy way to get user input um, that I can then pipe into the code when you want to do the simulation. Um, OK, once you have an app that does something cool scientifically, um, the question is now, of course, how do you publish this? OK, so, um, so you've programmed your notebook. It does what you want it to do, hopefully. Um, uh, the steps to getting it actually published in Notebook are fairly straightforward, but not very obvious. Um, so the first thing you have to do, so have a, a folder where your, where your notebook is stored, where you've built your project, right? And there can be multiple notebooks, by the way. It doesn't have to be just one. You can have multiple notebooks in the same folder or in the same project. But you should have one notebook called, I, I call it main, always. You don't have to, but it's the main thing that should start um, when you launch your code. And then inside a folder, you want to create a directory in there called middleware. It has to be called middleware. Um, and inside of that folder called middleware, there has to be a script called invoke. Not invoke.sh, not invoke.txt, just invoke. Okay? And inside invoke, there will be a command that looks something like this, hash bang, um, user bin invoke app, name of your app, start Jupyter, um, and then these various flags, the, the notebook that it should start, and the dash u anaconda, it says what, um, which, uh, which sort of Python interpreter you use. Okay? Um, so, and that's it. This is, this is all that needs to be in that invoke script. OK? And you, you then uh, convert, make all of this into a GitHub project. Um, so uh, push it to GitHub. Um, OK, if you're not familiar with GitHub, I won't, I won't go through tutorials on that. But um, you, it's fairly straightforward. Create a GitHub account. Um, make a repository. There's all kinds of tutorials for that online, if you're not familiar. Um, and then just compile all of this into a, uh, into a oh, wait, does this actually show? OK, we're not going to, we're going to step through. I guess I put more, uh, <laughs> I guess I do have step-by-step -step instructions for, um, for, for making the Git, uh, the Git repository. But anyway, um, so this is, uh, uh, yeah. So this is the basic idea for, for how you, um, oh, I see, right. I remember now why I put this in. In case, uh, to, to get to the GitHub content, it's, or to, to, to run Git commands, Git status, Git update, um, Git commit, um, you have to use that, click that new and then terminal up in the bottom, in the top right, click New and then Terminal, and that'll get you to a command line where you can actually run, um, uh, use GitHub commands to, to, to build your repository. OK, and then finally, um, you go to this page here, nanohub.org slash tools slash create, um, and you'll create a web page. And what you'll do here, uh, so you'll describe the tool, but then at some point down the screen, they'll ask you for the GitHub address. Um, and you just create the GitHub, you just copy and paste in the GitHub address for your, for your tool, and then submit it to them, and then everything else is handled by NanoHub. Um, so you, you literally just have to write your code, Make it into a GitHub repository, um, and then create this page, uh, or, or, or submit this form, and then NanoHub will create a page for the tool. Um, they will. Uh, you have to. The GitHub repository has to be open source um, if you want to. I think that's true. It has to be open source so that they can pull from it. Um, there, there is a way to use a NanoHub, some other NanoHub repository, but I don't know how to do it. I've never done it. There's some other NanoHub. Uh, OK, that's OK. <laughs> I recommend just using GitHub. <laughs> so if you, if, if, yes. NanoForge, is that, I, don't, I don't know what it is. But there, there, there's, there's some other, if you don't want it to be open source, it is possible to do that. Um, but, uh, 
but I think you can. I don't know if there's a way to use that using GitHub or if you have to work with with the NanoForge. Yeah. In any case, talk talk with the NanoHub people if you want it. If you don't want it to be open source, talk but Tanya. talk with Tanya if you don't want it to be open source. That's right. Um, okay, and that's and that's basically it. Um, oh, there's <laughs> uh, right. Um, I won't talk about this much. I'll, I'll just say there's some complication. Um, so if, if, you're, if you're writing a web page for a class and you want to update your materials often, there's a little bit of a complication there. Um, because uh, anytime you make a change to your tool, you have to republish it. Okay? And that has to be approved by the NanoHub administrators, okay? Which are, who are usually pretty fast, by the way, within 24 hours, almost always. Um, uh, this, get, this works. But if you realize there's an error in Lab 3 and you need to push out an update now, um, it, it's a little bit inconvenient, right, to have to republish your tool every time you make a change to the curriculum. Um, we have found a, a, a way to get around this, which is that you have sort of a, a front end pro to your project, which is the, the thing that gets published, and then a back end, another GitHub project, um, where the front end project pulls material from the back end project every time. So you can update the back end project as much as you want. And every time the front end project loads, it'll pull that material so that you've got up to date content to your site. Um, so there's, there's, if, if, you, if, you're, if you're dealing with that stress in your life, <laughs> uh, let me know, and I can, I can give details on how to do this. But, um, it's, uh, uh, but if, if, if you're just publishing like a standalone simulation tool, of course, you just publish it once and you're done. No complication needed. Um, oh, and then also, I guess the, 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 other, the other word of caution I'll note is there's some, uh, there's some nuance here to how you store data on NanoHub. So by default, when you run a simulation session in NanoHub, it stores, it, it runs in a temporary directory that disappears after you exit the app. Um, so any files that you create in that directory will be gone um, when you leave. Um, and believe me, you don't want 100 physical chemistry students knocking at your door asking, where did my um, data processing code go <laughs> after I closed the app? <laughs> Um, take my word for it. Um, uh, so there's there's a little bit of nuance there. What, but what you can do, um, and, and the NanoHub, NanoHub tech folks have, have been really helpful in, in making this work, um, you can actually create a separate standalone in your invoke script. You can make a link to a separate standalone directory, which will always be there um, in the student's Jupyter Notebook directory. Um, and, uh, and then they can, you can sort of copy your materials there as you create them. Um, and you can do that, again, in the app, you don't have the student doesn't have to download and re-upload or, or move things, drag things by hand. You can automatically copy all of the materials that the student needs to save to a new directory, which will be permanent, um, and then they won't get lost every time the student logs out. So, just just be aware that that's that's a thing. Um, okay, and that's um, that's all I was going to say. Um, uh, it's, it, we, we've had really great experience working with NanoHub. Um, the support folks have always been um, very prompt and helpful in getting things installed. There's a bunch of backend packages you can use. We use Gromax, Pymol. Um, uh, games, as George mentioned, is, is there, and, and, and many others. Um, and there, there's, there's magic commands. I'm not, I'm not kidding. This is, this is the, the lingo. There are magic commands in Python to access those. So you use something like use Gromax, um, and then you can run Gromax commands in your Python script. It's awesome. Um, so it, it, the, the interface is quite straightforward um, in, in many ways. Um, and uh, yeah, it has uh, a lot of power for, um, for incorporating both for educational purposes and for research grade materials. So with that, I'll stop talking, and I would be happy to take any questions. Yeah. Is there a way to control the Python version or the package? Yes. Uh, uh, let me see. Um, yes, there is. Um, I forget. Yeah, so definitely the Python version you can definitely use just in that invoke script. I'm reasonably sure you can add a flag here that controls the Python version. Um, Right, right, right. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, so, so far, at least, um, whenever I've needed updates, I've just emailed the tech folks and they've updated it. <laughs> um, so I, uh, it is possible to build a local Python. So initially, I built a lo local Python libraries for obscure packages um, and then just included them with the, I mean, they're open source, so they, they included with my, with my original open source package um, so that you have a local copy to access. Um, but uh, when I published that, then they complained and told me, just get rid of that, we'll install the package ourselves. So um, the better thing is just to inst uh, ask the tech folks to install it, and they will. Yeah. That's as complicated as it's gotten in, in terms of version usage from my end. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. So if you 
Okay, so you talked about uh, running fairly ambitious jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, suppose you have to go beyond that. Uh, right, right. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Um, so we haven't yet, um, or, or at least we haven't, um, I mean, so we, we're a computational chemistry group, so we, we, we run big jobs all the time. Um, but uh, but uh, in the context of the, the work we've done on NanoHub, we haven't had to go beyond the limits available. Um, the, the best option, I think, for, for going beyond what you can do, well, I mean, there, there's different ways you could do it, right? So you could, you could run the job in sequence, right? So it's possible to store the outputs and then continue the trajectory, for example, if you're doing MD. That would be something that could be coded in fairly easily if you want to just run, you know, submit, submit a job many times to, to get gradual uh, addition, uh, uh, you know, gradually increment the simulation. Um, if you want to run a really big job that's way out of bounds of anything, I think the best you could do is create the input files here. Um, and then um, it would be relatively straightforward. Create all the input files, download them, upload them to your local, um, you know, exceed or whatever, whatever you want to run. Um, yeah, yeah, that would be my, my thought. Yeah, Ming. Do you need to kill the job? Yeah, so it's all, it's all handled um, by, a, so by, by the sort of the NanoHub backend. So there's, there's a Hublib um, GitHub, uh, GitHub project, which, which has a queue handler in it. It's, it's sort of a graphical queue handler um, where you, you um, submit the job. Uh, so you, in your Python script, you have a command that's something like, you know, hublib.submit, some, something along those lines, right? Um, and that pushes it off to a queue, and you specify a queue and a wall time and all this stuff. And that pushes that off to the, to the queue um, and then sort of keeps a link going to see what's happened so far with the, with the job. You can, you can detach from the queue, and then the job will keep running in the background. Um, it's a little bit tricky to reattach. Um, uh, so what, what we do actually is just uh, we, we keep, a live, keep the link live where you have to keep the window open while the job runs. Um, uh, which, as long as the job's only four hours, it's not so bad. But, um, but you have to worry, watch out for the stability of your internet connection. Um, but but it, it's also possible to detach and then reattach later and check and see what happens. Um, they just get angry at you um, if you detach from a bunch of jobs and then forget to reattach. Um, again, not that I've done that, but I think they would get angry at you if you did it. Um, OK, anyway, yeah. OK, yeah. Uh, I got it right. Sorry. But, uh... So, uh, from what I've seen, it's just like uh, you know, the, the contributors, the institutions that contribute to you know, uh, the primary users. Uh, is it something that, you know, from some other university, uh, does the university have to uh, begin to collaborate? Right, with right. Individual, you know, individual universities? Right. No. And anybody can log in, and it, it's it's free to create an account. Um, and uh, at our tools, for at least, are are open source to anybody worldwide. So we have you know we have people from from all over the world who log in. Not that many people, but we have a few <laughs> from all over the world who log in and use the computer. And 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 then through that public interface, you can submit up to four hours of jobs on on one of it's a Purdue cluster that actually runs them, um, but it's submitted through NanoHub and run through NanoHub. Um, uh, but no, you don't have to have any affiliation with Purdue. Um, to do that. Okay. I think uh, we'll be done there. Happy to chat if you have more questions. Yeah.